Good evening and welcome to today's event, which is the first of a series of events from the Jesus College Perspectives, looking at aspects of long-term thinking. My name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum at Jesus College, Cambridge, which you can see behind me on a only very slightly sunnier day. Our aim is to get people thinking and talking about the crucial issues of our time, including the past and the future. Jesus College itself is ancient. We've made many, many changes. We were originally a 12th century nunnery and became a college in 1496. We've been through civil and world wars, pandemics of the past and of course of the present. So we are at least somewhat used to trying to think on the long term. We've had lots of stellar speakers come in through the Intellectual Forum. Fashion designer Jimmy Chu, the former New Zealand Prime Minister Helen Clark, the, the, the current Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization, Peter S S Singer, and many others. And we've shown off the amazing work that's being done by our own fellows and our own academics, using synthetic biology to come up with new ways to um, dry clothes, experiments with the coldest things in the universe, and work on how to do sustainable finance properly so that we can make a difference to the world in the future through financial routes. And if you want a real treat, do have a look at the Jesus College YouTube channel where many of those events are captured. We're also recording this event tonight. We know that many people can't always make these as they happen. And so you'll be able to see that there in a few days time as well. And for a bit over a decade, We've run a series of high level roundtable conferences with discussions about really big issues, bringing together people who look at them from very different perspectives. You formerly called the Rustak conferences, they're now the Jesus College Perspectives. And over those years, we've looked at lots of important subjects, food, farming and climate change, the future of homes, housing and urbanization. We've looked at the North-South divide in the UK and on China's role in the world. We are hugely grateful to the JCP members for their ongoing support to enable all of those and this event to happen. So to Nick Chisholm, to James Dodd, Albert Ellis, Sheila Kassain Marshall, Robert Marshall and Andreas Nauman, many thanks indeed. And if, you're, and if you are interested in helping to support these events, please do get in touch. Reports of those previous discussions and events are also on our website. We hope you find them interesting and thought provoking as well. We haven't been able to run the normal in-person events over the last week, and so we've turned to online discussions. And tonight we have the first of our series of events looking at long-term thinking. The last year has seen a short-term emergency with some essential short-term thinking, but it was an emergency that could have been better tackled by some longer-term thinking beforehand. Pandemic preparedness would have made a huge difference in how we dealt with the last year. So we've planned to bring together a series of brilliant speakers together to discuss different aspects of long-term thinking. And we're delighted to have such a brilliant person with us tonight to start that off. But before I invite tonight, introduce tonight's speaker, let me just say how this will work. He and I will have a conversation, but I want this to be a discussion not just between him and me, but with all of you, the audience who are here. So please do get engaged. You can use the Q&A feature on Zoom, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, to ask questions. And I know we always say that we want just questions, not comments. This time we actually want your comments. If you agree or disagree or have a view on any of this, please do put those in. And I will try to feed those into the conversation as we go. So I hope that's clear. And with that, I'm really delighted to welcome one of the country's leading public philosophers to join us. Roman Kuznarek is the author of seven books covering hugely important subjects from empathy to the history of real tennis. His most recent book is The Good Ancestor and How to Think Long Term in a Short Term World. So Roman, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's a huge pleasure, Julian. Really looking forward to see where our conversation takes us. So before we actually talk about The Good Ancestor and, and Long Term Thinking itself, can we just talk a bit about your own background? What, what made a young Aussie become a public philosopher in the first place? Well, it's been a very wayward journey, actually. Um, I was originally a political scientist of a kind back in the 1990s. I did a PhD on an obscure aspect of Guatemalan politics. 
I even did a little bit of teaching at Cambridge for a while in sociology and politics uh, back in the late 1990s. But I ended up leaving academia and starting to work with a historian called Theodore Zeldin, who wrote a wonderful book in the 1990s, in fact, which I've got, I just happen to have here on my shelf, uh, called An Intimate History of Humanity. Uh, absolutely brilliant book. And Zeldin's idea was that it's conversations that can change society. And I worked with him on a, a project, a, a charity he set up called the Oxford Muse, spelled M-U-S-E, which was invented to create conversations between strangers. So we did this crazy stuff, like we'd invite CEOs and people living on the streets and old and young and people from different religions for meals. But instead of giving them a menu of food, we gave them a menu of conversation with questions on it, like, what have you learned about the different varieties of love in your life? Or in what ways would you like to be more courageous? So the opposite of speed dating, talking for two hours, not for two minutes. But through that, I got interested in the topic of empathy, about the what psychologists call cognitive empathy. That's the capacity to step into the shoes of another person and look at the world through their eyes. And I wrote a book about that um, called Empathy, unsurprisingly. Um, and I also founded a museum called the Empathy Museum. And what the Empathy Museum does, and this is sort of part of the wayward journey, is that it's got a number of exhibits which travel around the world. And one of them is called um, A Mile in My Shoes. And it's a gigantic shoe box. And you can go inside and you can put on, literally put on the pair, a pair of shoes belonging to a stranger. It could be a Syrian refugee or a Brazilian sex worker or a NHS nurse. And you can actually walk in their shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their own life in their own words. It's really powerful. It's very playful. It's been in Siberia and Brazil and you know, in the US all over the place. But what it does is it raises a question about long-termism in a sense and future generations, which is, okay, we can step into the shoes of people in today's world in some ways, we can have conversations, we can listen to their stories, but how do we do that with respect to future generations? And that was the kind of niggling question at the back of my mind when I was thinking about writing this book, The Good Ancestor. How do we make that connection um, intellectually, uh, emotionally across the generations? And that was an incredibly challenging thing to do. So that's kind of how I, I got to where I am uh, today. And, you know, I'm an independent writer. I have no, you know, I'm not part of any university or development agency or, or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think of myself as a public philosopher, just a term I made up, um, really, because I heard that in the Netherlands, they have this idea of a public philosopher, which is someone who's interested in the philosophical questions of the art of living, but not just in individual life, but in public life as well. How should we live writ large? So those are the kinds of things which um, stimulate my brain. And, and it's a wonderful title. Just before I actually get on to The Good Ancestor, can I just pause for a moment on, on, on that empathy idea? And it ties in something I was going to come on to later, the, the, some of the Rawlsian ideas of the veil of ignorance and trying to think what would it be like if somebody else was there? Um, your project is, is fantastic, but obviously we live in a world where people struggle to be empathetic sometimes, to, to understand the lives of people who are frankly not that different from themselves, who come from a slightly different ethnic background or a slightly different location, when you can see them and understand their lives. Um, even before we look on people who don't yet exist, how do you think we can help people to understand those who do exist who they could talk to? Well, it's a big challenging question and I've dedicated years to thinking about how do we do this in a practical way that can make a difference in public policy and communities and everyday life. Um, one way to think about it is about how we educate our children. So for example, in Canada, there's this fantastic program. Um, it's an education program called Roots of Empathy. And the way over a million children have done this in many countries, and the way it works, I've been to witness it in like poor communities in Toronto, inner city Toronto, it's amazing. What they do is they invite a baby into the classroom. So between there's kids aged between say five and 12 and the baby comes in, not alone with a parent and an instructor from the program, the kids sit around the baby and they start talking about the baby. Why is the baby crying? Why is the baby laughing? Why is the baby suddenly looking up at the father or mother? And what they're trying to do is step into the baby's shoes, that imaginative leap of cognitive empathy. And they use that as a jumping off point for then talking about, well, what's it like to be a kid bullied in the playground? Or what's it like to be a family sleeping on the streets of Kolkata? And 
the interesting thing about Roots of Empathy, they've done a lot of detailed impact studies and it, it not only increases empathy levels and social cooperation, it reduces bullying, but increases general attainment in literacy and mathematics as well. And one of the interesting things about Roots of Empathy is that they also get the kids to start thinking about the baby's future, about what responsibilities do they have to that child decades from today? So that's just one way that I think there are movements out there trying to challenge the kind of hyper individualism we've inherited from the 20th century, which has come from consumer capitalism, which has come from the self help industry, you know, where the question is, what's in it for me? Who am I? You know, well, this is all about who are you, really? Fascinating. And, and for what it's worth, we have some work that will shortly, hopefully, be coming out uh, connected with, with the Intellectual Forum, looking at polarization, how we can tackle that. Right. And actually, just thinking about Cambridge, I mean, uh, you know, Simon Baron Cohen, you know, who's written brilliant books on, you know, coming from his research on autism about the power of empathy and it's important in social and political life. You know, he's a really important figure in, in this. Um, now, I'm very keen to get on to good answers. We, I do want this to be a discussion with the audience as well. And we have had one question which has come in already. So, so please, the rest of you do, do put things in. And just very briefly, so we can move on. Why have some species evolved empathy and others not? I mean, are humans as abnormal in, in being empathetic as we think? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, the person to really answer this is someone like a, an evolutionary biologist like Franz de Waal at Emory University, who's a primate specialist. And um, what his research has shown is that, you know, uh, mammals, primates, exhibit a capacity to see the perspective of the other and take action based upon that. But it's particularly well developed in human beings, actually. So, you know, my kids, right, I've got twins who are now 12. <laughs> But when they're about two or three, they started developing this capacity to step into the shoes of the other. So before that age, you get this situation where, for example, my daughter, my son might be crying and his sister would try and comfort him with her favorite toy dog, which was a kind gesture, but no use to him. By the age of three or four, once they developed that cognitive capacity to see the perspective of the other, when my son was crying, his sister would try and comfort him with his favorite toy cat. And that's the empathic leap that makes all the difference. And, you know, as the evolutionary biologists and primatologists like Franz de Waal argue that this trait has come out of a long uh, history as, as a survival strategy for group survival. In other words, you care for others in order to protect yourself and the pack, whether it's predators are coming or share food when times are tough. And so you know, a lot of this, there's lots of debates about group selection or not group selection and all sorts of things like that. But basically, there's this idea that we've developed this capacity over long periods. It's what makes social bonds work, makes us cohere as groups. And that is a uh, beneficial to us in terms of survival. So fascinating things about empathy. And, and we could talk a lot more about that. And there may well be more questions come in. But Fano, I would like to get on to, to, to your most recent work, The, the Good Ancestor. Now, it's, a, it's an incredibly clear and very powerful read. And frankly, anybody who's, who's listening to this who hasn't yet read it really should do. Um, but just in case there are a few people out there who haven't yet had a chance to read it, could you just briefly set out the main arguments in it? We'll, we'll, we'll pick into a few of them in, in a moment. Sure. So The Good Ancestor really begins with a question. And it was a question raised by the great immunologist Jonas Salk, who developed the first polio vaccine, of course, in the 50s. But in later life, he said, the big question facing civilization is this, are we being good ancestors? In other words, how are we going to be remembered by the generations to come? And he believed that if we're going to be remembered well, um, and if we're going to tackle the great challenges of our era, for him, he was worried about the destruction of the living world and the nuclear threat and things like that. He believed we need to expand our time horizons. So instead of thinking on a scale of seconds and, and minutes and, and hours, we need to think on a scale of decades, centuries, and even millennia. And I was really fascinated by Salk's question about how we become good ancestors, but also fascinated by the fact that, you know, almost frustrated in a way by the fact that I could pick up a newspaper, as we all do, and you can see people complaining about the short-termism in society. You know, the politicians who can't see beyond the next election, the businesses that can't see beyond the next quarterly report, the nations that sit around international conference tables, bickering away while the planet burns and disappears. And of course, as individuals, we're clicking the buy now button. And I remember just reading so many reports about that and people saying, what we need is more long-term thinking. But 
then I started asking myself, well, what is long-term thinking? Are there different kinds of long-term thinking? Is it always good for us? And in fact, if I could just share my screen very briefly, let me just show um, one image from the book um, here, um, which is this one. What I ended up coming up with after years of trying to think about this was a kind of a, a picture of what I call the tug of war for time. And on the one side, you see six drivers of short-termism and the other side, six ways to think long-term. And the, the drivers of short-termism, some of them are very familiar, like political presentism, you know, that being caught in the next election, the digital distraction and 24 seven news, the ups and downs of speculative capitalism. Some of them are deeper issues like the tyranny of the, of the clock, you know, the way that clock time has for 500 years been increasingly dominating Western society and speeding it up. You know, the first clocks in 14th, 15th century um, used to chime maybe once an hour, maybe every 15 minutes. By 1700, most clocks had um, minute hands and by 1800, they had second hands. Um, so time has been speeding up. And of course, the clock became the key machine of the Industrial Revolution, according to uh, people like um, Mumford and others. But on the other side, these six ways to think, uh, six drivers of short termism, termism are, are matched in a way by six ways to think long term. And these are the kind of key ideas that structure um, the book. And in a way, I've tried to explore those, recognizing that I think we all get to thinking about long-termism in different ways. We care about different issues and need to recognize that. I mean, if you think about it, there's a bunch of long-term issues in society today, which are sort of on the public agenda increasingly so. We know we need more long-term thinking, as you said in your introduction, to plan for the next pandemic that might be on the horizon. We need long-term thinking to deal with technological risks, risks from synthetic biology or from our AI. We needed to think about racial injustice, which is getting passed on from generation to generation and other wealth inequalities. And then, of course, we need long term thinking to deal with the threats of the ecological crisis in all its different facets. And there's a kind of paradox there, right? The need for long term thinking is incredibly urgent. And I would just say one more thing here, which is just because of what I've been doing today, just this morning, by chance, I've been recording a, a program for Radio 4. Um, they've, they've got a program called Positive Thinking. And um, it's gonna come out later on in the month. And it's a debate about today, that this episode is about future generations and whether the UK should have a future generations commissioner like they have in Wales, right? And maybe this is something we'll come back to, but the point I really wanna make is there's something in the air when radio programs are debating this kind of thing. And um, there's also some social movements dedicated to long-termism. A bunch of time rebels are out there bringing this issue to the fore. So that's really where the book comes from. It looks at these six ways to think about long-termism and then tries to look at ways they can be put into practice and in fact are being put into practice. And I mean, I think that that diagram you shared earlier is, is in some ways, for me at least, one of the central linking pieces of the book. I mean, I, I found that I kept sort of coming back to it and, and, and thinking on it. Um, and I was absolutely going to talk about sort of the idea of a future generations commit, um, commissioner. So maybe, maybe now is a good time to think about that because you have a whole section about deep democracy. Um, I, I've had political involvement myself. I'm quite interested in some of these things. And the idea that you have of guardians of the future. So that, you know, the Welsh Future Generations Commissioner is an example, there's a few others now. Um, legal mechanisms to ensure intergenerational equity. You also talk about citizens assemblies, which are also a, an idea which have suddenly become quite real. You have a fourth thing which you say is, is important in that space though, which, which I particularly like to question you on, um, though there may be other questions or comments uh, from the Q&A about any of those, because you're also a fan of city-states. How does that tie in? Yeah, um, well, there's certainly, I mean, if I look at the way democracy works today, in fact, when I think back to when I was a political scientist in the 1990s, and I was apparently an expert on democratic governance. Now, during that time, it never once occurred to me that we effectively disenfranchise future generations, that there are billions upon billions of people who will inhabit the future, tens of millions in the next few decades in this country alone, yet they have no political voice or rights or representation, even though our actions impact upon their lives and increasingly so, maybe at no moment in history have our actions had such potentially destructive impacts on future generations. Of course, in a way that goes back to July the 16th, 1945, when the first nuclear test happened, the Trinity test, 
at that moment, in a way, humanity developed its capacity to destroy the future. But we've been pushing it even further since then with climate change, ocean acidification, all sorts of things. Um, and so I think there's a real question there of, well, okay, imagine we want to redesign democracy to, so it responds better to these huge long-term challenges that we have, because it, it wasn't designed for this. This is what, not what the 18th and 19th century version of representative democracy that we have was designed for. What are the options out there? Now, as you say, one of the options is the idea of a kind of a guardian for the future, a kind of platonic idea of a particular position, which, or which has the um, remit to represent future generations. And that's what they have in Wales. And that future generations commissioner, Sophie Howe, is brilliant at her job, even though she has very little power and an incredibly small budget. Um, but as my daughter, who's 12 now, says to me, she says, well, why should I think a future generations commissioner is going to be good at representing my views and my friends' views and people who maybe live in different parts of the, the UK? You know, and, and for my daughter and many other people, there's a, another option there, which is the idea, for example, of citizens' assemblies that you mentioned, that there's been a huge amount of, let's say, democratic energy around deliberative democracy. There's been citizens' assemblies in Ireland, um, the UK Climate Assembly, the Scotland Climate Assembly in, in Paris, in, in Spain, in Belgium, other places. The idea of, in a way, reviving an ancient Greek kind of participation, much more broad in its inclusiveness of who is in the demos, who's the people. Um, but that certainly had legs. And in fact, one of the things I was arguing this morning in this Radio 4 program, uh, Positive Thinking, was that the UK should have a future generations, not commission, commissioner, but a commission. So not a single person, but like a, a panel almost of a, a mixture of representatives from the four nations of the UK to acknowledge devolution, but also to include young people. But th that commission itself should be informed by a citizen's jury or a citizen's assembly of some kind. Um, so that's a kind of a second area. And that, in fact, that, that model I just mentioned there is exactly what's in a bill currently before Parliament called the Wellbeing for Future Generations Act, which was introduced by... Um, the founder of the, uh, the big issue, John, uh, John Bird. Um, and we'll see how far that bill gets. It's had its second reading in the House of Lords, but uh, you know, private members bill, but it's the top of the ballot. So it might do okay. At least it's gonna create public debate, which I think is good. So if you wanted to reinvent democracy, there are a couple of options, a guardian, uh, citizens assemblies. I think a third option before, I will come to the bit about yeah. devolution um, and, and city states. Um, I think a third area which is really fundamental is the idea of legal reform. I mean, I never thought I would find law so sexy and interesting, um, but there is incredible um, activity around trying to embed rights of future generations in different countries. Um, so not just the rights for young people today, but for people who are maybe not even born. In the US, there's a, a movement called Our Children's Trust which is campaigning on behalf of 21 young people, in fact, suing the federal government on behalf of 21 pe young people for, uh, to secure the rights to both current and future generations to a clean climate and healthy atmosphere, basically to stop the US government subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. That's a David versus Goliath struggle. It will go on for years, but there've already been successful legal cases like that in the Netherlands, a case called Urgenda. And in fact, Germany's constitutional court um, just a few weeks ago, made a landmark ruling um, basically against the government saying the government was violating the rights of future generations because the government's carbon emission targets were too limited. They were basically dumping problems on the future. So even though England has just beaten Germany 2-0 in the football, I think Germany's beating England at least 2-0 when it comes to intergenerational rights and intergenerational justice. They're, they're way ahead. So I think there's a lot of good um, activity there in law and also and if there's anyone here listening, you know, in, in, from the legal realm, um, not just rights for future people, but rights for the living world. So there are movements around that, the idea of ecocide or in Aotearoa in New Zealand, we know there's rights have been granted to the Wanganui River, sacred to local Maori people. Um, so there's uh, Ecuador, other, other countries where that's happening. But to your actual question, Julian. <laughs> well, so just, just before you do, just yeah. be, one of the comments that's come in, I do want to try to bring in audience comments is it's just a very specific thing from Garth Wilkinson which just follows on that do you think ecocide should be made illegal right do I think ecocide should be made illegal I'm not a lawyer 
you know, and I, I can't pretend I have great knowledge of this. And look, but when I look at the International Criminal Court, right, on the one hand, I'd say, well, what a hopeless institution. You know, it has, I don't know, maybe prosecuted six people or something like that, you know, half a dozen, maybe a few more. Why would you think that that institution is going to be very good at um, protecting the living world? Because the idea of the ecocide movement is that ecocide should be a, a crime like genocide and, and prosecutable under the, as part of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, but I think when I talk to international lawyers in this field, um, you know, a lot of them point out, well, actually, legal changes take a long time, you know, and, and institutions improve over time. In France right now, there's a big public discussion about ecocide, right? It's not quite happening in this country yet, even though there've been key um, figures like Polly Higgins who've tried to promote it, but um, it, that conversation about ecocide is gonna get stronger and stronger. So actually I do, um, my, I would like to see ecocide to be a, a crime under international law. I think it, though it has to be one of many, many mechanisms out there. Um, but so then on the question of the city states, um, this is really interesting. Um, what the evidence shows is that the more devolved and decentralized a country is, the better its long-term public policy performance. Um, now you might think, okay, well, how do you know that? Well, in my book, I got a bit nerdy and looked at a whole load of data on this. And I work with a great statistician called Jamie McQuilkin. And he's developed something called the Intergenerational Solidarity Index, which um, measures the long-term public policy performance of 122 countries on 10 indicators. I used to love, I used to do a lot of work on quantitative political science. And um, so I love this stuff. And I know it's really, there's all sorts of problems with measuring things, you know, but um, this measure looks at 10 different indicators of environmental, social, economic policy, whether it's renewable energy in your national energy system or uh, long-term investment in healthcare and education. And what it shows, it shows many things, but when you try and look, look at the kind of broad correlation, let's say, between intergenerational solidarity and decentralization, there's a very strong relationship. Um, so you get countries like Switzerland, for example, doing very well, highly decentralized and a lot of long-term public policy. Um, and that's really, really fascinating. And, and it raises, you know, I think the data, you kind of use it as a hypothesis and then try and look then at the historical. But what we know about cities, for example, is that cities rarely die. You know, cities like Istanbul have survived for thousands of years while nations and empires have risen and fallen around them. Cities are really good at dealing with long-term problems. The first grid cities emerged in ancient Greece in the fourth century BC. Um, look at the way that London responded to the, the great stink of 1858 when raw sewage was being dumped in the Thames. That was a moment of crisis where finally the um, parliament passed the legislation to build the sewers, right? And those sewers, you know, uh, masterminded by Joseph Bazalgette, the great Victorian engineer and 22,000 workers, I might add, and 318 million bricks. They built the sewers over a period of 18, 19 years. And those sewers are still in use today. Incredibly kind of long-term in its, vision and that's the kind of thing that cities are really good at so i have a lot of faith in cities and let me just say one more thing i think something that we're seeing emerge and i think we'll see emerge more over the next few decades is cities acting interdependently creating their own networks you think when trump pulled out of the paris agreement well 279 us city mayors said we're going to stick with this you know and we're going to stick with 1.5 they defied trump or there's the C40 group of cities to take action on climate change. They're a bit like the Hanseatic League in the 16th, 17th century. Interdependent cities, I, see, I think we'll see more of that. And, and it's just worth noting that uh, the UK is the, the most centralized country in Europe other than Malta. Uh, right, but on the other hand, you know, before 2000, the, U the UK had no directly elected mayors and now it's got about 25. So something is going on. Yeah. But there is progress. I was going to partly say on a lighter note, a number of years ago, I, I jokingly suggested that Cambridge should become independent. Uh, and, you know, we, we had a, a navy of pumps and so forth. But maybe, you know, Cambridge is an independent city state is, is, is the correct solution. <laughs> maybe you well, think that's too small or too, maybe too big. Well, it has to be part of it. I think the key part of it is to think of it as a sort of a, the, the whole, bio, you know, a bioregional area. So it's Cambridge plus its, its region. Um, <laughs> Yes, I, 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 I do tend to agree. <laughs> Unless you want to turn, you know, you can see those lovely lawns 
uh, in the photo behind you, turn all those into allotments would be a good thing, which of course happened across Oxbridge colleges in the Second World War when we were digging for victory. So uh, maybe uh, Cambridge could be or, or, or an autarky of some kind. And, and if you look slightly further behind there, you would see some more natural growths and wildflowers and various others. We are working on this, but that's another conversation uh, to, to, to have. On. Just while we're on democracy, is there a role for, for voting? Here and and you know there, there's been conversations about you know we've talked about young people and, and, and their votes. Um, there's a press for votes at 16, which has happened in Scotland and it has happened in Wales, but it hasn't happened in England. Um, there's comments. Uh, there's a comment from somebody called anonymous attendee, one of our regular attendees, um, who who comments that in the Brexit vote, people donated grandparents or parents donated their votes to underage children. David Runciman, as you may know, has said that he thinks that votes at 16 is simply far too weak and we should have votes at six. Is, is there a role for this? So during the time of the last UK general election, my partner and I decided to give our votes to our then 11 year old twins. And so we sat around the kitchen table and we debated the party manifestos and taught them about the electoral system. And then they told us where to put the X on the ballot sheet. And I guess the good news is they didn't exactly follow their parents' political opinions. One of them did and one of them didn't. And in a way though, that was a symbolic gesture, uh, of course, because I don't think changing the voting age is the fundamental change we need, to be honest. I know it's popular uh, and I love David Runciman's great podcast he did where he was arguing slightly tongue in cheek that six year olds should have the vote. Um, and that, that was fantastic. Um, but I think even if when you lower the vote, voting age, say to 16, the politicians are still caught in the same short term electoral cycles. You know? and um, as far as I can see, I haven't seen fundamental evidence that lowering the voting age um, empirically, I haven't seen the evidence that it fundamentally leads to new types of public policy um, favoring future generations that you wouldn't otherwise have uh, obtained. And that's actually why I think that the, what you need to do is try and redesign other aspects other aspects of the democratic system. For example, having future generations commissions or commissioners, having citizens assemblies, decentralizing. Yes, vote, lowering the voting age could be part of a package because it's also about changing the culture of public discussion. So I'm not against lowering the voting age, but I just don't think it's, it's too easy, I think, as a kind of a, a solution um, to these deeper problems of short-termism built in. I mean, there, there is an argument that it rebalances the voting public to have a, a younger profile, but um, that, that is another question. We're, we're getting a few questions, um, which is probably my fault, about the two-party system, which I think um, we may have time for, <laughs> and whether pluralist economies, societies uh, do better. But can I just, because you talk about in your, um, I think it's in the six ways to think long about, yeah, seven, seven generations ahead. So you're saying that we shouldn't just think about the current six-year-olds, that even David's suggestion is, is, is far too minimalist. We should think about the six-year-olds to come. Yeah. Well, how do we do that in a way that's likely to represent what they will actually want? As opposed to just imposing our own views and values and imagining incorrectly. Yeah. So I certainly think that human beings have a capacity to think about those future generations. And we care about those future generations. In fact, a recent study by Portland Communication, which will be published uh, tomorrow, um, shows that two thirds of the UK population actually want government to be more engaged in long-term public policy, partly because they know what's happened with COVID and they know more planning is good in public health care, but also partly because they, want, they know there are threats coming their way for their children and grandchildren, particularly climate change. So there's a public sort of support um, for this. But then you can get the, that question that you raise is, OK, well, how do we know about that future? And what right do we have to impose our vision of what it might be or what those problems might be on the future? Now, in general, I think that kind of argument is, it's a kind of sneaky argument for political apathy and, and apathy more generally, because it's an argument I often hear um, in you know, some political circles saying, look, the future is so uncertain. There's no point trying to plan for it. We don't know what's coming our way. So let's just deal with it when it comes our way. Well, by the time it comes our way, it's too late. You know, there's a Brazilian saying I heard the other day, which is you only learn to swim when the water has reached your waist. You know, well, 
by the time it reaches your waist, it's probably too late. Uh, could well be too late. And the way I think about this is, of course, there are things about the future that we don't know about and we can't plan for very easily. Like, I don't know if the year 2049 is going to be like the year Blade Run, like going to be like the film Blade Runner 2049 and the machines have taken over, right? We don't know about a lot of those technological changes. But there's certain things, particularly around ecological impacts that we know about. We know pretty much uh, that as business as usual, we are heading to at least three to four degrees of heating and one to two meters of sea level rises. Of course, it's varying and so on and how far we're going over the planetary boundaries. But we know what's coming our way. And we know that I know, you know, my daughter, 12 years old, could easily be alive in the year 2100, right? And I know that she will need air to breathe and water to drink. And so will all her friends and communities and everyone she depends on. So if I care about her life, I have to care about all life in that deep ecological sense. Um, that's the kind of common denominator we've got to work with. But of course, there are other things that we know are coming. Just look at, you know, anyone who studies demography, like the great Tony Wrigley, you know, another great Cambridge long-term thinker. Um, we know about the age uh, profiles that, we're, we're, that are coming our way. We know we've got aging populations and we know that's going to impact on the health system and the welfare system more broadly. So there's a bunch of stuff that we know. But let me say one more thing about this is that one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so sort of emphasize so much the need for citizen input into thinking about the future is to recognize that there are a plurality of futures. There are people who care about different futures issues. Some people really care about the ecological crisis. Others are worried at thinking a lot about racial injustice and the legacy of slavery. And, you know, the whole thing at, at Jesus College about Tobias uh, Rustat, is it the, the, you know, who was involved in the slave trade in Africa and, and renaming your series, you know, so th there's a, there's a kind of cultural impetus around that. There are other people worried about long-term mental health issues. If you listen to the debates in the House of Lords about the Future Generations Bill. So we need to make sure there's a plurality of citizen voices in there. But basically, I think this future is not nearly as uncertain as we think. That would be my starting point. Um, so just while we're talking about sort of long-term thinkers, one of the great thinkers at Jesus College uh, was Malthus who obviously was quite interested in population, which is a, an issue which applies. Isn't there a bit of a challenge that we know that an ever-growing population is a huge challenge to, to the planet, but is it not in the interests of people in the seventh generation to be born? How do, how, how do you think about the fact that stabilizing population, stopping the sort of very rapid growth that we've seen, which may be essential, means that we're not going to have people born at all. How do you weigh up their interests? Ah, that's one of those great philosophical dilemmas. If you read Derek Parfit's books, that's the stuff you have to write essays about. It's a tricky, tricky business. Um, I guess on population, what I'd say, I mean, just to step back a bit, is that, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about population is I think often people are just asking the wrong question. Um, that, you know, people will of, often say to me, well, isn't the big problem just we've got too many people and you know it's just growing and growing and growing and that's the great long-term problem but i think most people don't know you know that in fact the the peak rate of population growth on the planet well that, that peaked in the early 1970s in fact population growth has been declining since then that danny dawling the oxford geographer uh, has written a good book on this called um slow down and also his book population 10 billion um and i think you know if you're worried about population just in, in general the question really is not so much, we, we know how to deal with that. You know, we know from at least 50 years of work in development economics um, and other related fields that if you want to slow down population growth in low-income countries, you empower women and you educate young girls and that kind of stuff. That is the best way to slow down population growth. The real population, pro pro population problem is um, per capita carbon emissions and material use in wealthy countries where population growth is stagnant, right? So in fact, it's, it's, it, it's not really, I don't think, it's not so helpful to think about it in, 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 in the way of, you know, ah, it's escalating, it's escalating. But as to the question of um, what about all those people who will be born or will not be born, um, you know, actually, I don't have a big problem with thinking that if population growth slows down, or if we don't have as many babies, that we're depriving uh, people of potentially 
having the gift of aliveness um, in, in that sense that I don't think that's the big issue. What we do know, I think the issue is that we know that there will be human beings populating the earth in decades to come. And the question is, what are we going to pass on to them? And that's the, the essence of the seventh generation philosophy, which is found in many Native American cultures in Haudenosaunee or Lakota nation peoples. Um, it's a kind of, it's about ecological stewardship, but you also found it in, in the Moluccas Islands where they, you know, in village councils, they look seven generations forward, seven generations back in making decisions. And I think we've lost a bit of that uh, connection today. And one of the really interesting things I discovered when writing this book, The Good Ancestors, is that in Japan, there's this amazing movement, which is directly inspired by the Native American idea of seventh generation decision making. And it's called future design. And in fact, I'm going to just put on my little future design robe, which I just happened to have here because it was on my desk from this morning. Um, let me let me explain while I've just put on this rather fetching orange and white robe from the small town of Yahaba in northern Japan, population 50,000. Um, so this the way future design works, it's a it's a method for local government decision making, and they invite local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live, and they typically divide them into two groups. Half are told their residents in the present day, and the other half are given these robes to wear. This is a genuine one, and told to imagine themselves as residents from the year 2060. And it turns out the residents from 2060 systematically advocate far more transformative plans for their towns and cities, whether it's long term investment in healthcare or in uh, taking action on climate change or automation. And this movement, future design, is now being used in this method, is used in big cities like Kyoto. Uh, Japan's Ministry of Finance, um, big companies like Fujitsu. So it's a really interesting way of trying to uh, operationalize, not a word I usually like using, um, the idea of that seventh generation principle. And so that's when I'm thinking about future generations, that, that's how I'm, one of the, the kind of ways I'm going into the question. And, and I think we have people here from the, the city and county councils who maybe maybe could learn that. And maybe even Jesus College could choose to have some fellows from 2060 at our next society meeting and, and see if that changes the conversation. Why, why not? In fact, I did a, a workshop at my kids' local school, state school, the other day, um, getting them to imagine the school in 2050. And I was telling the kids, look, your, your own children might be here in 2050. And they were kind of amazed, but it made them really think about, well, what kind of school do we want? You know? Um, so I'd like to move on to think a bit more about ecological sustainability and, and, and inequality issues, but just to pick up a couple of the comments that have come in. So, so David Stoughton says, isn't thinking about the future as much about not closing down possibilities as it is about defining what should occur? Uh, which I think is interesting. There's, there's a comment you may or may not wish to, to, to pick up from a, another anonymous attendee, or maybe the same one, I don't know, uh, about whether pandemics are a way of nature's way of telling us to slow down. That might be controversial now. But I'd quite like to just pick up on Ellie Kirkland's question. Um, is long-term thinking different or more common among different age groups? And perhaps more broadly, are there people who, of, of, of different ages, different, you know, wh wh whatever parameters you want to, to think, who do think long-term and people who don't? Yeah, so there have been life cycle studies of long-termism, long-term thinking. Um, so it tends to start rising when kids, they, uh, are about five, six, seven years old, they start learning about the idea of thinking in decades or centuries, right? But then when they become teenagers, um, it tends to drop off and, you know, so do many other things, empathic capacities and so on, you know, with puberty, et cetera. Um, and there's some, there was really, some really interesting work done on this in the 1950s, actually. Um, and pointing out that human beings, at least these studies in the Western world, um, were um, by the time people reach mid age, they tend to start thinking about their deaths, right? When you meet middle age in some form, 30s, early 40s, lots of debate about exactly when. And the, the concept was invented called generativity. This idea that when you start recognizing that your time may come to an end, um, you start thinking about what legacy you're going to leave, right? And I think the really interesting thing about that is that we tend to think about legacies in very different ways. So one can have a very kind of egoistic form of thinking about the legacy you want to leave, like a, a Russian oligarch who wants to have a football stadium named after them. Or you might have a, a more familial sense of legacy, right? I want to pass on my house or culture to my children. 
But then there's something a bit broader, which is a more universal sense of caring about the universal strangers of the future. Um, and I think that's more the kind of Jonas Salk idea of caring about, about being a good ancestor. So I think in a way, there's, there, is, there are those life cycle studies, but also there's a bunch of studies which say that for most people in general, the future goes dark after about 15 or 20 years. Most people find it really difficult to think beyond that. But actually the way I think about it is that we're constantly in a kind of a, a struggle in our minds between the short and the long, what I call the, the marshmallow brain and the acorn brain. You know, do we party today or save for our pensions for tomorrow? Do we upgrade to the latest iPhone or plant a seed in the ground for posterity? And the, the marshmallow brains named after that famous psychology test from the 60s where kids had a marshmallow put in front of them if they could resist eating it for um, 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow. And of course the majority couldn't resist and snatch the snack. Now there's lots of critiques of the marshmallow test. You know, it's influenced by socioeconomic background, you know, poor kids distrust the testers and so they snatch the snack. But actually what's missing from the marshmallow test, I think, is the recognition that we also have this, this acorn brain. This is the part of our brains which focuses on long-term thinking and planning and strategizing. It lives here in the frontal lobe, particularly a part called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Lots of studies of this, but basically it's a new part of the brain. It's only been around a couple of million years, um, but it's better developed in humans than most other creatures. So a chimpanzee will plan ahead a bit. They'll get a stick, strip off the leaves and turn it into a tool to stick into a termite hole, but they'll never make a dozen of those tools and set them aside for next week. But that's exactly what a human being will do, right? That's how we built the Great Wall of China and voyaged into space and built Basil Jet sewers and built Jesus College Cambridge. You know, it required that kind of capacity. So even if there's life cycle differences uh, going on throughout our, our own lives, we all have this acorn brain. The question is really how are we going to learn to switch it on and get public institutions to help us do it? And econ economic institutions too, which in a way goes to, um, you know, David's, you know, question. Um, about about boundaries, and we can talk about that uh, uh, if we wish. If, if you'd like to, yeah. Yeah, I'm just I've just sort of slightly lost it for some reason on my um, list here. Wait, I'm just trying to find it again. Ah, oh, right, here it is. Isn't yeah. thinking about the future as much about not closing down possibilities as as it is about defining what should occur? Ah, this I love. This is a thorny and brilliantly put question. Thanks, David. Um, how do I think about this? Actually, I do think it's about closing down possibilities to some extent, but it's about which possibilities do you close down? Now, in the 18th century, Britain started closing down a possibility called slavery. It took a long time, right? Because it was, you know, all sorts of reasons why the slave trade and slavery itself ended. But we no longer think it's right to have that option to own another human being, right? There are always limits being put on our freedom. This is the story of human history. Um, so the real question to me is what are the kind of limits that we should be imposing today to enable us to thrive and flourish? Now, let me give one possible way of thinking about this. Um, here, I've got a little prop, okay? Now this might be familiar to some people. This is um, the model of the donut of social and planetary boundaries developed by the British economist, Kate Rayworth. I know in Cambridge, there's a donut coalition and this model is, very popular, it's sweeping the world, it's endorsed by David Attenborough and the Pope, and it's being used in Amsterdam and Carly in Colombia and Bermuda and all sorts of places. But the way it works for those who don't know it, in the middle, there is a social foundation, which is a sort of basics that we want to get people above in terms of water, food, and healthcare based on sustainable development goals. And on the outside are nine planetary boundaries developed by earth system scientists like Joram Rockström and Will Stefan, things like climate change and um, uh, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss. And the idea is that we should get people above the social foundation without going outside those, the ecological ceiling. So it's about not about constant GDP growth, which of course has been the mantra for left wing, right wing and center government since the second world war. It's about thriving in balance. And here is our global selfie. Um, we are failing on all of the indicators on the social foundation, the bigger the red segment, the bigger the failure. And we're going over at least four of the planetary boundaries for which we've got good data. So to answer David's question, actually, I think we do need to impose limits. We need to be operating within this safe and just space. This is just in terms of economics. And I remember um, talking about this with, um, his name escapes me, uh, Kevin Kelly, 
the great founder of Wired magazine, you know, California futurist. And I was talking to him about the donut and, and he really didn't like it. He said, I don't like being bounded. He said, technology hasn't, innovation hasn't happened with boundaries and limiting possibilities. And the way I think about it and the way Kate Rayworth talks about it is that, look, Mozart composed on a five octave piano. You know, Jimi Hendrix played on a six string guitar. Serena Williams plays within the boundaries of the tram lines. So let's play within the boundaries of the ecological ceiling and that social foundation. There is a space for innovation, freedoms, liberties within that. But we need to respect that if you're really going to think long term. You know, and if I say one more thing about this, I learned a lot about this. You know, when I studied economics uh, at Oxford in the late 1980s, um, I learned very standard economics, you know, a demand and supply diagram on a white background where there was something missing, which is a circle around it called the biosphere. And years later, I had to read up myself on ecological economics, people like Herman Daly and others, uh, and teach myself some of this stuff. But what that led me to was the discovery of the brilliant biomimicry thinker Janine Benyus, um, B-E-N-Y-U-S, if you, know, if you, you know, watch her TED talk if you haven't seen it. And what she asks, she asks a question, she says, She's very interested in how do we learn from nature's 3.8 billion years of R&D. And she says, well, how is it that other creatures have survived and thrived for 10,000 generations or more, more, whether they're bats or birds or beavers? And she says, well, it's by taking care of the place that will take care of their offspring. In other words, live within the boundaries of the ecosystem in which you're embedded. Do not foul the nest, which is what humans have been doing at an ever-increasing pace and scale over the last century. And that idea, I think, is really the fundamental of ecological economics and the donut and so on. That is the boundary in which we must express our possibilities. So, yeah, I'd say don't worry about the boundaries uh, and being bounded uh, and, and things like that. Let's just, just innovate within them and live within them. So I, I was planning to, to, to lead nicely towards Donut Economics and Kate's work, because I know you know her very well, uh, but you, you nicely introduced it. Real. And it is such a powerful idea, you know, that, that the diagram and, and um, you know, I hope people could see the prop. If not, do have a look at, at Donut Economics, because it is such a fascinating idea that there are minima that we don't want to be below and maxima that we don't want to be above. And that therefore there's a sort of self safe range, you know, on a on a. Um, a solar system scale, just like planets that are too close to the sun are in trouble as, as they are too far out. So uh, really pleased that you've picked that up. Um, and I'd like to come back to inequality, but just while, while we're on this, Garth Wilkinson has said, um, talk about another Cambridge uh, academic, shouldn't the Partha Gupta report be taken much more seriously by economists and politicians? So that's looking at biodiversity issues. Yeah, so I am in the middle, I have to admit, of reading various parts of that report, which is very long. <laughs> And I was particularly interested in the sections on discounting, and in fact, a little bit disappointed with them. Um, but I need to look at them more closely. Um, clearly, those issues about you know, biodiversity need to be at the center stage of public policy. Um, personally, I'm not a great believer in natural capital accounting, um, and he is, uh, I understand it, and, um, and I know many people are. Um, I don't think that we should be pricing uh, or, or converting all of nature into one single metric known as a dollar or a pound or some kind of monetary metric. Why? Well, imagine you're driving a car um, and imagine there was only one dial to look at. And that dial was telling you about your speed and how much petrol you've got left or, or battery power you've got left. And I was talking, telling you about the revs and telling you about all sorts of things. Well, you wouldn't drive that car. It's too dangerous just to have one metric. We actually need to have a multiplicity of metrics. And in fact, that's what the donut offers. You know, These are all very well established measures. <laughs> the measures you can see on this side, of course, people debate about what are the best measures of ocean acidification and so on. But we've been developing these measures for decades. So let's use them in fact, I think what happens when you do the sort of Dasgupta route and you convert everything into monetary metrics is you're losing information, actually. Why would you want to do that when we've got these really good metrics? Now, I know it's not as simple as having a single number like G GDP, but even Simon Kuznets, the inventor of you know, GDP, you know, would have probably looked at the world today and said, 
no way would I just rely on one indicator. We've got this, all these other indicators which tell us about other aspects of well-being, about the planet, and so on. But you know, I do think though it would be good if people did read the Dasgupta report just because it is foregrounding all of these issues, not always in the ways that I would necessarily agree with. And as I said, I haven't read the whole thing. I've probably read a third of it. Um, and so I'll, I'll revert, reserve my, my, my judgment. But the more of this stuff that's out there, uh, the better, because it's actually challenging the short termism in a very deep way of our um, political institution system. I mean, for what it's worth, I, I, I agree hugely with you on this, both, both I mean, GDP uh, has been a huge problem for a long time. Uh, there was an all party group in, in Parliament on wellbeing economics, where, you know, we used to highlight that if you have a massive oil spill and then clear it up, GDP has actually risen. Boom, up what, it goes, right? Say, way, well, hey, we're all much happier because we've been able to clear up the oil um, after we spilt it. And I also share the concern about trying to map everything into cash, because it does assume that money is the, the only good measure of value and that it's a linear scale. And we already know that a thousand pounds is worth very different amounts to a billionaire, to somebody who's really struggling. And so trying to assume that everything else can be collapsed to it just fails in so many ways. But it's probably a step improvement from, from ignoring it completely. But that does bring me on to, to a question I did want to, to explore, uh, which also been introduced by, uh, commented by, by one of our friends, anonymous attendees. So there's, there's the idea of the Maslow hierarchy of needs that sometimes you're trying to deal with the bare essentials of, of life and then gradually you can you know, uh, get, get to more sort of complex thinking. So to phrase it using the, the question here, this long-term thinking, is it the preserve of the privilege to have the time and space to debate these issues compared to those who can't because they live from hand to mouth? Um, yeah. Are we being naive to think that, that people can actually find the mental space to pass on the marshmallow? You know, a starving child, we would want to have the marshmallow, surely, rather than to plant the acorn. You know, Groucho Marx once said, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? <laughs> and, but I think there's something very serious in that, of course, which is that people are dealing with their everyday struggles today. You know, they have lost their jobs during COVID. They've got mental health issues. They're, you know, a billion people living on under $1.25 a day or whatever the current figure is. And those issues are really real. Um, and I remember actually when I, did, I, I sent a draft of this book to a friend of mine called Kevin Watkins, who's the outgoing CEO of Save the Children, just to see what he thought. And he said, well, Rowan, what, what's all this stuff about future generations? There are 150 million children today dying of malnutrition. And we end up having a long conversation about this. Now, this is a slightly different issue, actually. And I'll come back to the one of the question. But what we ended up agreeing on. And in fact, if you look at Save the Children's big post-COVID report, it talks all about being good ancestors, a recognition that long-term investment in healthcare and education of children has massive benefits in terms of resilience to economic crises and ecological crises. So there's a real a kind of a confluence of the interests of current and future generations there. This is what Sophie Howe argues as well in Wales. But on the more particular question about privilege, that's a really important one to raise. Um, I recognize that, you know, there are 220 million migrants and refugees in the world today. There'll be 450 million probably at least by 2050. They're trying to put food on the table, live from hand to mouth. Um, so one might then think, okay, long-term thinking is a matter for the privileged, you know, white privileged middle classes in Western societies. But actually, it's worth questioning that. And that's what I increasingly question as I did the research on the book. So just to give you a few examples, firstly, indigenous cultures, which are very committed to long-termism, those which are, are often actually typically at the bottom of the socioeconomic pile. I mean, if you look at Native American communities in the US um, or um, First Nations people in Canada or Maori uh, people in Aotearoa, New Zealand, they are not at the socioeconomic top of the, the, the pile, yet they are the ones who are talking almost more than anybody else about intergenerational problems intergenerational wealth inequality, intergenerational racism uh, passed on and the need to tackle that. And I think it was very interesting during when Black Lives Matters emerged that there was a lot of discussion actually about time. Uh, in fact, there's a great book by Leila F. Saad called Me and White Supremacy, a, uh, a black activist, um, which talks about being a good ancestor on the first page. And I think part of the recognition there is that 
if you think about what legacies we want to leave to future generations, we need to think about what we've inherited from the past. Now, clearly we've inherited some positive things like the cities we live in or medical discoveries we still benefit from, like from Salk and others, but we've also inherited negative things too, legacies of slavery and colonialism and racism that create deep inequities that must now be repaired or legacies of economies that are structurally addicted to endless growth and fossil fuels that we now need to transform. So there's a question of what we're gonna pass on, but those communities are often the marginalized in many ways are engaged in that intergenerational struggle. And I'd say one more thing, I was just thinking about this the other day, when you see photos of refugees crossing the Mediterranean, parents holding their children, risking their lives. Why? Because they're thinking about their children's futures. You know, They're thinking decades down the line, actually. Um, I saw that my father was a refugee. He deprived himself of all sorts of things for my future. You know, He was looking forward decades, even when he was struggling as a, as a refugee when he first arrived in Australia, not as extreme as, uh, uh, you know, um, people in war-torn countries today and so on. But so I think there's a, uh, let me say one more thing. Often it's those in the most privileged part of society who have the narrowest view of their legacy, like an aristocrat who wants to just pass on their country house to their children. So I think there's a, there's a complex conversation to be had around this, but definitely we should ask that question of uh, around privilege. Um, we have only maybe sort of 10, 15 minutes left. So um, those of you who still have, have questions going, we'll try to get to the ones that have come in, but um, you know, we are beginning to run out of time. There are not things to say. Can I ask about technology and the pace of change that we're seeing? And uh, let, me, let me phrase this by, by bringing a, a cartoon strip. So uh, I don't know if you read the comic strip XKCD, but it's um, utterly fantastic visually. There, there was just one that, that caught my eye last week when I was thinking about this talk was a time traveler who, who goes back to 1991. And uh, somebody there said, oh, well, welcome to 1991. So you're from 2021. What happens with technology over the next 30 years? Well, we passed a federal law to combat laser attacks on airliners. There's TV shows where robots battle. Cordless phones have, have really long range and it's really easy to send news stories to your friends. Wow, okay. Now try to guess which one of those turns out to be the most important. Surely it's the lasers. It's not the lasers. You know, we couldn't predict the way that social media has transformed just so much of what happens. It's, it's caused so many disruptions, so many problems, as well as benefits as well. How do we think long term if the rules are able to change on a very short term basis? Ah, it's a tricky one. Um, of course, it's how can we plan for and think long-term about the things that we don't know? And I'm not quite sure how we can possibly do that, except to try and think about general principles of operation. So let's say in the economic sphere, as I've you know, talked about the, the idea of the donut or related ideas of the circular economy, for example, that no matter where we go technologically, I think, at least I'm convinced that we need to learn, our economies need to exist within and operate within safe planetary boundaries, right? If we're really caring about the long term, we need to imagine the, the economy inside uh, the biosphere um, and that there are limits to that, um, whatever happens with technology. And equally, you know, actually the question, your question just made me think about um, some conversations I had with, UK civil servants a few months ago, where you know it was a series of meetings about things like um, synthetic biology, and you know the impacts that that is going to have. Now CRISPR technology and so on is going to have amazing, huge impacts. Now, I was a bit disappointed that the civil servants and some of the sort of government people were mostly thinking about the business opportunities and not thinking about the ownership principles. Who owns the technologies seems to me to be a fundamental question around symbio, around AI, because if we want to direct these technologies to dealing with getting us above the social foundations or staying within the ecological ceiling or caring about the welfare of future generations, then we need to think about how they're regulated and how they're owned, right? Um, and is CRISPR technology going to be used to make designer babies uh, or it's going to be used for something else? Or is AI 
big data searching capacities going to be used to, um, you know, make, I don't know, life easier for the very wealthy in various ways? Or is it going to be used to help us understand how to distribute fertilizer more effectively uh, and use less of it, which, you know, there's great evidence that AI is fantastic at, at that kind of thing, have massive benefits for people. Um, so I would say that in the realm of who knows what's going to happen, um, I think there are certain things we need to think about, like ownership, you know, like the ecological boundaries, like at least maintaining a plurality of voices. So when we're thinking about the future, we're not just thinking about Elon Musk's future. You know, he says, I want to die on Mars, but not on impact. Well, that's one future. But, you know, as people like Martin Rees, you know, have, have, have argued, well, actually, it's going to be what we need to worry about is the collateral damage of that. We need to first learn to live on this one planet we know that sustains life, then take as many trips to Mars as you like. You know, that's not quite, that's more my view than his, but it's they're pretty close, uh, I would say. I mean, I, I think he's pretty much right on, on that. So, um, you know, we, we know the sort of limits that we need to, to work within the principles, let's say. I don't know, what's your view on that, Julian? What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think you're right. that it, There will be lots of things that change. I mean, seven generations, time to come, you know, AI, just pick one of your examples, will be so completely different now that things that we thought were not doable will simply be easy and trivial. Um, I think it's an interesting question as to how many resources become digital. You know, if you want to replicate a car, you need a lot of resource to make a car. If you want to replicate an amazing virtual reality space, yes, there's some electricity costs, yes, there's some overheads, but giving everybody one of these doesn't have to be a big uh, cost to everybody. You don't have to drag things down. So I quite like the idea, again, going back to the, to the donut, we say these are the hard boundaries, but we may be able to get a lot more out within those boundaries than we were able to before. We may have much more efficient ways of, of, of generating electricity. You know, you know, it's, it's often said that nuclear fusion is 20 years away as it has been for the last- Always years. is 20 years away. Yeah. Some, someday within those seven generations, it might be only 10 years away. Um, so, but we could still say, but there are still some fundamental limits. There's only so much pollution we can tackle. There's only so much that we can do. But I think there will still be things because you know, no sci-fi writers predicted social media and the effect that that would have. So I think there may well still be some curveballs. I was just going to say on your Elon Musk future, there's a short story recently by, I think it's N.K. Jameson, uh, which explores some people leaving to design their perfect society. And it's a, I won't spoil the story, but it's a, a, a brilliantly terrifying view of, of what happens and then how the rest of society recovers. Yeah, she's fantastic, actually. Um, and sci-fi is really a, a good way into thinking about these long-term issues. I've got piles of sci-fi books just by my arm up here. <laughs> all, all those, uh, sci some, some sci-fi also had very limited perspectives and, uh, you know, but it, it is getting better. Um, we don't have that long left. There's still a number of, of questions. I, I would like to look at one that's come in um, about religious faith. So um, the question is, doesn't religious faith generally encourage long-term care for future generations? Okay. So religion's a really interesting issue here um, because religions have been the most effective social system for creating values that humans have invented. So they really matter when it comes to issues like intergenerational justice, uh, potentially. So the question is, are they talking about the long term or not? Well, I think here you have to sort of look at different religions on one level. So the Catholic Church is a really interesting one because the, the Pope's latest encyclical, Laudato Si, 2015, Praise Be, is really fascinating because it talks about intergenerational justice and intergenerational solidarity and long-termism and ecological stewardship. It's amazing. And in fact, I did an event recently for the European Laudato Si Associations of, of, of Europe. Um, I mean, I'm not a Catholic, but they, what they're, they're trying to shift their social action from talk, dealing with poverty issues today to dealing with long-term issues because this is what the Pope's encyclical says and they've got a seven-year program to deal with it and so they're grappling with that because actually the Catholic Church hasn't talked a lot about future generations in the past and of course there's a whole bunch of research going back decades on uh, Christianity's general problem of uh, lack of the idea of, of dominion you know that basically earth is here for human beings to have a nice time um, but that's been challenged by ideas of Christian ecology for many, many decades, but that's still in process. I had a really interesting conversation with a 
Japanese Buddhist monk um, recently called Shokai Matsumoto. He's a very famous monk. He's written a book about how to clean your temple. It's all about mindfulness. Um, and he said to me, he said, he'd read my book and he said, well, you know, what's really interesting to me about this is that in the two main Buddhist traditions in Japan, um, there's a lot of the idea of coming into the present moment in order to transcend time, to try and connect outside the present moment. There's a lot of looking back at the past because of Japanese culture and the idea of ancestry worship and that kind of stuff. But he said, look, I have to admit that us Buddhists in Japan, we don't think about the future very much. We don't think about our future ancestors as I think of them as much as our, our kind of our ancestors. So I think religions have a mixed um, record on this, but I'd say that there is one massive religion which is really good on long-termism. It's called the global ecological movement. Now, one wouldn't normally call that a religion, but since the 1960s, hundreds of thousands of organizations have emerged around the world who basically kind of worship the same God it's called Gaia, you know, Mother Earth in some form. They have, some of them will have religion in their, in their manifestos, others are secular, but, and they'll have different things that they care about. But basically there's this growing idea that this earth is this sacred object even if a secular language is used, that we must preserve. And I actually, while I was in the middle of writing the book, Richard Dawkins uh, was, uh, you know, who lives in Oxford, I, I asked him, I said to him, actually in a big public meeting, I said to him, I, I said, look, that I, I gave him this idea that actually isn't there a rise of a kind of religion of worshipping Mother Earth? And don't you think at this moment in history, when there is we're faced by these ecological crises that having some sense of the sacredness of the earth is not really such a bad idea. Now, I thought he might bite my head off, you know, because he's that kind of guy. But actually, he gave a really, really interesting answer. He, he sort of, he said, he's, this is to sort of paraphrase him broadly, I actually quote in my book, but he basically said, well, I can see that there might be at least instrumental reasons for treating the earth as a sacred object in order to motivate people to care about it. So there we have one of the most hyper-rational people in the world, probably the world's most famous atheist, actually kind of admitting, at least instrumentally, you know, not going too far, um, about the importance of a, a kind of religious, spiritual something, connection with the earth. So I think religion is something we need to take seriously. It just doesn't always look like what we think it looks like. It might actually look like Greenpeace or Fridays for Future. Interesting question. What, what, what counts as a religion? As, as a humanist, I would argue that you can care passionately about the earth without using sacred language. And I think there's, you know, um, but, it, but, it, but actually the narrative that says that religions are generally becoming more aware. Um, I'd love to explore that more in the context of some of the US where there seems to be a sort of breakdown with some religious movements. They're not being quite so uh, progressive. But I think we're pretty much out of time for this. I mean, which is a huge shame because um, I would quite happily go on for another couple of hours. You, you probably have other things to do than sort of spend the whole time here. Well, I love this stuff. Really, really interesting questions from lots of different angles. So thanks to everybody for uh, all your questions and thoughts and, uh, and comments. So, and, and it is also slightly, I have to say, seems to me that a discussion of religion seemed like an appropriate place to finish a meeting with Jesus College perspective. I mean, we are, we're actually not even named that officially, but uh, <laughs> you know, there, there, there is a historical link there. Oh, Can I say one more thing about religion? Sorry, I know you've got to end very, very fast. Most religions and ethical systems have some idea of the golden rule in them. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Let's take that intergenerationally and think, let's do unto future generations how we would have want past generations to have done unto us. I think if Jesus was around today, he'd probably say, yeah, I can agree with that one. I, I, absolutely, I agree with you. And, and just for what it's worth, one of the questions which we didn't come on to, because I didn't really think it was quite a question for you, uh, was about whether Jesus was the first college to aim for net zero. So we've just recently published uh, a very, you know, very far reaching set of strategies about both what we do as a college, and we are aiming for net zero by 2030 on scope one and scope two. Um, we're up for doing that. There's some technical challenges about whether the city council can actually deliver all the electricity that we'll need, and, you know, but we're, we're aiming for, 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 for net zero by 2030, as well as divesting and aiming to do impact investments, and everything else. So I don't, I can't be certain that we're the first college. I believe we are um, to, to, to the person who asked that question. But thank you so much, uh, Roman, for, for a really fascinating, thought-provoking set of comments. Um, I've certainly enjoyed it and learned a huge amount. I will be 
going back to, because I didn't manage to scribble down all the people you referred to. Um, and for anyone who's listening, you know, do have a look at the book. It is fantastic, as is the rest of Roman's work, the rest of his talks. Roman, I hope we can welcome you to Jesus in person at some point, uh, because it would be lovely to get you there, whether it is to get that allotment on the grass behind me or for some other purpose. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a huge pleasure and a wonderful way to start, up this, start off this series of talks. Well, thanks so much, Julian. I will bring my spade and trowel with me to dig into that lovely lawn. It's a deal. <laughs>